Turn with me to the book of Jonah. Anybody real know what's, what's found in the book of Jonah? Big old, big old bass. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's uh, it is the ultimate vacation Bible school Sunday school story. I mean, it captures kids' attention. It captures my attention. Uh, I mean, the, just just the debates that people have about the debates that you know, well, there ain't no way that anybody can fit inside the big belly of a whale. One thing it say. Well, it said great big fish. Then it also said that God prepared it. In other words, it's not just your normal fish. God prepared that fish in order for that to happen. I did this. This was one of the first series of things that I ever did. It was to go through the book of Jonah. And then, as, I, as the years go by, you go back and you look at sermons that I, I, that I've, I look at sermons that I've done back early in my ministry and I said, no, that thing ain't going to work. But I went back over this and I was looking at it and I said, you know what, this is pretty good. I, and I think it's important that we get the proper attitude and perspective on the book of Jonah. It is not a fairy tale. It is something that really actually did happen and that is so relevant for us as adults today that we could, it just reeks on us as far as about things that we need to do in this life. Jonah, the first chapter. Let's look at the first two verses of Jonah in the first chapter. Verse 1, it says, Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, verse 2, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it. For their wickedness has come up before me. Let's, let's, let's talk about the characters. Because this is kind of important in this story. Who was Jonah? Well, Jonah was a prophet. Okay? Uh, you could say, well, Jonah was a preacher. Yeah, it's not quite the same. But you could say that that kind of position in society, he was the word of God. God would give him word and, God, and he would just faithfully and turn around give it to the people. Yeah. Pretty much preaching. So, uh, he was, they had, they had uh, prophet schools at that time. There was a whole lot of stuff going on. You know, uh, they had a, uh, a whole bunch of prophets all claiming to have God's word. I don't know if God was giving them words or not. Maybe I, he probably he probably was. But you would think that a prophet who hears from the Word of God would actually listen to God to the Word of God when it applies to them. Makes sense. They actually are the one hearing God's word, and here Jonah was was a. Prophet, preacher, and uh, he was just going about his business. I will tell you something. There is something about Jonah here that will lead us to believe that Jonah is a bit self-righteous. He's, he's a bit self-righteous. What does that mean? It means that he thinks that he's better than everyone else. He makes himself better than everyone else. Why do I say that? Well, who is Nineveh? Where's Nineveh? Nineveh is not a person. Nineveh is a city. It was a great city. It was a great city. And he wanted Jonah to go and preach to the Ninevites. Well, isn't that what preachers do? Is go preach. Now, let me tell you, God has not been calling me over to the Middle East you know, as a missionary preacher. Okay? That is not their call. Neither has he been sent, wanting to send us already here, but he's not been wanting to send me to Hawaii to start a mission. That's, that's not 
the case. God has called me here, and this is where I am for, for now. It's, you know, subject to the Word of God. So, what's his problem? It's not like he has to go live there. He's just going to preach to them. Well, they were evil, wicked people. Okay? So we're not supposed to preach to evil, wicked people. No, that's not what his problem was. In the his historical record here, we'll find that for some reason, Nineveh and Ninevites, he hated them. He hated them. Maybe it was something that had happened in the past, but the Ninevites, they were, they were wicked and evil people and they had caused all kinds of issues and problems. It'd be like saying, I want you to take your worst enemy in the whole world and I want you to go show them some love and tell them about Jesus. Now, I'll say that makes it a little more personal, doesn't it? Well, they don't deserve that. And besides, that'd be way too uncomfortable for me. And what did God want Jonah to do? He wanted him to preach to him. And Jonah said, no, Lord, I can't do that. I'm not going to do that. This was not God asking Jonah to do this. Okay? This was not a choice that Jonah had. God told Jonah, go and preach to Nineveh. There was no out clause. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, there's no fine print in there. He just told him to go. So, when God tells, I don't know about you, but when somebody tells me that I have to do something, my first thought is what? <laughs> okay, I hear about it. That's my first thought. Now I'll think about it depending on who's telling me. <laughs> but depending on who's telling me, I might tell them no, but I might say yes, man. I mean, I'm... <laughs> no, but you know, no one likes being told what to do. God was telling him what to do. So how do you react when somebody asks you or tells you to do something? That you don't want to do. <clears throat> well, some try to talk their way out of it. Uh, some try to ignore it. Uh, just to pretend it's never been asked and it'll never, you know, they don't have to worry about anything. Some try to hide. <laughs> you know, sometimes kids will hide, won't they? They'll just they'll run off and hide. Or I love the time, I love the parts where the kids will come up and they'll come up and they'll try to talk their way out of doing something. Go take out the trash. It's not full enough yet. Now, maybe some adults do that right now. But uh, yeah, but here's the thing. You know, they try to intelligently discuss it with you, the adults and stuff. They're trying to get out of doing something. But you know what? A lot of a lot of people just run away. They just don't deal with it. They just run away from it. Jonah decided to run. God had told him what to do. And Jonah said, no, I can't do that. Why didn't he stay there? Why didn't he stay there? Why did he have to run? He just didn't have to go. In doing so, by running, it, things appeared to be much harder. I want you to think about this. God wanted him to go 500 miles northeast to Nineveh, overland, through the fertile crest, easy drive. Instead, he's going to take a, a distasteful sea voyage. Jews hate ships anyway, by the way. The, those, they, they did not like sea travel 2,000 miles west so God was sending him to the greatest city of the day but instead he was headed for a, he was headed for a remote trading post on the fringes of civilization 
He was trying to go to the furthest place that he could possibly go so God couldn't find him. The Lord wished to go with his prophet. Instead, Jonah tried to run from the presence of God. Oh, how foolish that is. Any path, I can't catch this, any path that a person takes away from God is a foolish and dangerous path. A lot of folks today on a foolish and dangerous path. We'll talk a little bit about the foolishness of trying to hide from God, try to run from Him. What can possibly be served in trying to outrun God? Well, one thing, you're going to lose your freedom. Now, you go rob a bank, guys, and you'll end up losing your freedom. You, know, you won't be able to go where you want to go, do what you want to do. In Jonah's case, he lost his freedom. He couldn't go where he wanted to go. He couldn't do what he wanted to do because he was restricted. Because in his mind, he thought, God's going to catch me if I go there. You'll lose your blessings. All the things that you, that you have, the blessings in your life, when you start running from God, you'll begin to lose those blessings. You'll lose your fellowship. When you're running from God, you will stop praying to God. You'll stop having a relationship with God. <coughs> and you know what? If you're running from God and you say that you have a great prayer life, you are a liar. Because when the reason why you're running from God is because you don't want to deal with God. You don't want because it's not going to be if you're praying about someone's, you know, some somebody else, he's going to say, stop, we got to get this taken care of first. And he's going to deal with you. And you know that when you go to him in prayer, you know that's what the stuff is going to be brought up. Do you ever avoid someone simply because you don't want a certain subject brought up? I don't, I don't deal with that today. I don't want to talk about that. That's why we do God. Hence the reason why we don't pray is because we're on the wrong path and we know when we pray, God's going, God, He's going to talk to us about it. And so we just simply run. Don't pray. You're in danger also of punishment. You know, God doesn't punish you if you, if you for a one individual sin that, that was done. I mean, if He doesn't punish you for that, we don't do that to our kids. But there's a point in time when you're on the wrong path and nothing is catching your, catching your attention to turn around and come back. Sometimes you've got to get punished. Sometimes you've got to get corrected. Sometimes you've got to get turned around. And God knows exactly how to do that. And where you run is more dangerous and then facing the music of God. You don't realize at the time, but where you're running is a lot more dangerous than getting right with God. You see, it's out of the frying pan and into the fire. Running from God is foolish. <laughs> Hiding from God is even foolish. It's, it's just as foolish. What did Adam and Eve do in the garden when, they, when God came calling and they realized that they had sinned? They were naked. They went and tried to hide from God. Did it work? <laughs> of course it did. <clears throat> of course it did. How embarrassing it will be one day when we look back and see all the times when we ran from God and we could have easily just God right with him. And him made our lives right. We're going to take a big passage, a big section of this passage and read it. Because it's, it's mainly the story here about what happened. So in verse 3, But Jonah arose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He basically got, got on the boat. 
So he thought that getting on that boat was going to take him from the presence of God. Verse 4. But the Lord sent out a great wind on the sea. And there was a mighty tempest on the sea so that the ship was about to be broken up. Uh, that's just a coincidence, I'm sure. Just a coincidence. In verse 5, Then the mariners, mariners, who were afraid, and every man cried out to his God and threw the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lie below. But Jonah had gone down into the lowest parts of the ship and had laid down and was fast asleep. <clears throat> they were up there. Now I want you to get this picture. To get the picture here. They were up there trying to keep that keep the weight down so that they would not fall into rocks. You know, hit the rocks. And so they were pitching everything off. And they were very afraid. Every time they pop, they would cry out to their God, help us, help us, help us. Because it was a serious situation. And where was Jonah? <laughs> he was down in the belly there. He was down to sleep. Just kind of... Isn't that exactly what happens? But isn't that, think about that. Isn't that what happens to us? We just kind of, the storm's all around us and we just kind of sleep in there. Now, in verse 15, I mean, uh, verse 6. So the captain went down, woke him up, and said to him, What do you mean, sleeper? Why in the world are you sleeping? Arise. He says, You need to call on your God. Perhaps your God will consider us so that we may not perish. <laughs> and he says, none of these other gods seem to have taken credit for this. Maybe it's your God that's doing it. So why don't you sacrifice and do something for your God so that we may not perish? The next verse tells us, and they said to one another, come, let us cast lots that we may know for whose the cause this trouble has come upon us. They were actually going to you know, cast lots to find out who it was. Uh, by the way, Jonah wasn't fessing up to it either. He wasn't. He wasn't going to tell them that it was him. And so they cast lots, and the lot fell upon Jonah. Imagine that. Verse 8. And then they said to him, Please tell us, for whose cause is this trouble upon us? What's your occupation? And, and where do you come from? Where is your country? What is your country? And what, uh, what people are you? They're going, they're asking the 20 questions. They're trying to find out how to save their lives. And Jonah says, I don't want to go back there. In verse 9, and so he said to them, I'm a Hebrew. And I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Sounds like a preacher answer, doesn't it? I'm Hebrew. I fear the Lord, the God of heaven. But did he really fear him? And he said, I made the sea and the dry land. And why is he using the sea and the dry land to try to escape from the God who made it? In verse, the next verse tells us, what the reaction of the men were. Then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, Why have you done this? For the men knew that he had fled from the presence of the Lord. Why are you running from God? You know why they knew? He eventually told them, oh, I'm running from this mighty God who made the sea. Was that any of the sailors' faults? Did they have anything to do with it? But yet here they are in the middle because of Jonah running from God. In verse 11, Then they said to him, What shall we do to you that the sea may be calm for us? What is it that we're going to have to do here to get the, the water calm? For the sea was growing more temptuous. In verse 12, then they said, uh, and he said to them, Pick me up, throw me into the sea, 
and then the sea will become calm for you, for I know that this great tempest is because of me. Just throw me overboard, and then you'll live. Verse 13. Verse 13. I misread. Verse 14, go back to where you were. So. Alright, and so they picked up Jonah. And they threw. Uh, There's four. Oh, there? Okay. I knew we was missing a verse someplace. Go back to 14. Therefore they cried out to the Lord and said, We pray, O Lord, please do not let us perish with this man's life and do not charge us with innocent blood. For you, O Lord, have done as it has pleased you. It sounds like they were more religious than the preacher were. And they're just old grubby sailors. They recognize God. Now let's go to verse 14, uh, 15. So they picked up Jonah and they threw him into the sea and the sea caused and the sea caused ceased from its raging. In verse 16, Then the men feared the Lord and exceedingly. They offered up a sacrifice to the Lord and took vows. We'll stop the story there. I want you to notice firstly Jonah's reaction. He did not care. Jonah was sleeping during the storm. He was hard-hearted. He was unaware of the trouble he was in. And all he could think about was getting away. It was all about Jonah. It was all about how he could save himself. It was all about how he could keep from doing what he didn't want to do. <clears throat> Jonah only acknowledged that he was the cause of the storm until it was brought to his attention. Until he was forced to admit that he was the problem. Jonah acknowledged then that he had done wrong, but was it sorry? Do you realize that you can acknowledge that you've done wrong, but not still not be sorry? He knew what it would take to save himself. He knew. Repentance and obedience. But he still refused to go to Nineveh. He did not have to be thrown over that boat. He could have at that point in time got on his hands and his knees and prayed to God, God forgive me, let's turn this boat around and send me to Nineveh. <clears throat> he didn't have to get thrown over. But yet that was his option. He would have rather died than to go. What I think happened was he was too prideful of himself and to humble himself before God and say, God, I'm sorry, I'll do what you ask. He'd rather have died. Now, is that how we react sometimes when God convicts our hearts about something? Do we run and hide or rather die than to get rid of our pet sin that plagues our life? To give all of our lives to Him instead of that little portion. I surrender all, I surrender part. Don't we run and hide when we're asked to witness to the lost friend or relative that needs Christ? Maybe there's a lot of folks that are running hiding because a lot of guys, <clears throat> because God wants them to surrender to the ministry. Maybe they're a saved child of God and there's people out there that God said, I want you to be baptized. I can't walk that aisle. I can't get up around too embarrassed. They're running from God because of it. Maybe they're running to ask Jesus, to, from Jesus to save their soul, to live forever with Him in eternal life. Maybe they're running from it because they can't. They don't want to surrender their lives to God. And God is chasing them. Yeah, I want you to return them down. The sailor's reaction was this: "Lord, save us!" <laughs> Isn't this amazing? When this, when we call storms in our lives by disobeying God, the storms typically affect other people besides us. It's not just about you. It's about those around you, the ones that you care about. It's the ones that are affect that your storm is going to affect their lives in some way. But compare the act, their reaction to this hard-hearted, self-righteous Jonah. 
they were convicted, aware and convicted of their of their danger. They knew that they were in trouble. Jonah didn't seem to have a care. He didn't seem to care about the trouble that they were in. Notice something else. They suddenly became religious. <laughs> they were talking about all their other people's gods and when nothing was to do working, they said, Jonah, what about your God? Maybe it's your God that's causing this. Maybe he can stop it. They uh, cast forth their wares. They, they turned over a new leaf. In other words, uh, they, they said they made promises to God. They may even said, Lord, if you'll get me out of this, I'll stop cussing. Because <laughs> you know they can cuss like a sailor. <laughs> now, isn't that what happens to a lot of folks? They get in trouble, they turn to God. Jonah didn't even do that. And he was a prophet. And they had a good enough good sense to at least turn to God even if they weren't being heard. Even if they didn't know this God, they at least they had a good enough good sense to turn to Him. They saw human help in Jonah. They had tried to save themselves with good, with human good works to no avail. So in desperation, they got rid of the cause of the storm, which was Jonah. And the storm society. When we get rid of sin through Christ, we'll have peace with God. We need to lighten our load too. So they surrendered to God. These heathens. God were other God worshipers. They feared God. They sacrificed to God. And they made vows to Him. Jonah, all he did was throw and get thrown over the boat. He allowed himself to get thrown over the boat. You see, even when we are running from God in the middle of life storms, God, God gives us opportunities to be a witness. Some of the storms that you go through, you didn't deserve. But your reaction to those storms are going to be a witness to those folks around you. So what was Jonah's witness? You know, when we're running through these storms, it seems, and running away from God, it seems the only thing we can think about is the running. How do I get away from it? How do I do this? One bad decision leads to another. When a witness says, what a witness Jonah could have been. I want you to think about this. What if, what if Jonah had told the, told the guy, Turn the ship around. I'm going to death. That would have been a, that would have been an answer. What if what if he got on his knees and prayed to God for forgiveness in front of those people, and then the storm stopped? That, that would have been what an example of witness that had been, showing the sailors what a great and great forgiving God that we have, Show, showing by example how the Lord rescues the perishing, and He cares for the dying. What an example that maybe people are looking to you to be that kind of example. Maybe God's wanting you to be that example. But instead, he chose to continue to make one bad decision after another. I want to talk to you a little bit about Chippy the Parakeet. Chippy the Parakeet. Have you ever heard about Chippy the Parakeet? Well, Chippy the Parakeet never saw it coming. One second he was perfectly perched in his cage. The next one he was sucked up, sucked in, washed up, and blown over. And the problems began when, when Chippy's owner decided to clean Chippy's cage with a vacuum cleaner. She removed the attachment from the end of the hose and she stuck it in the cage. Well, the phone rang. And she turned to pick it up and she barely said hello when she heard a Okay, and uh, Chippy had got sucked in. The bird owner gasped and put down the put down the phone and turned off the vacuum and opened the bag and there was Chippy, still alive but a little stunned. Since the bird was covered with dust and soot, she grabbed him 
She raced to the bathroom and turned on the faucet. And she held Chippy under the running water. And then, realizing that Chippy was soaked and shivering, she did what any compassionate bird owner would do. She reached for the hair dryer. And she blasted the pet with hot air. Poor Chippy never knew what, what hit him. A few days after the trauma, the reporter who had initially written about this event contacted Chippy's owner to see how the bird was recovering. And well, she replied, Chippy doesn't sing much anymore. He just sits and stares. You know, it's not hard to see why. Sucked in, washed up, blown over. That's enough to steal the song from the stoutest heart. And I suspect that all of us. One decision leads to another bad decision. To another. They're just making the worst of a bad decision. Jonah could at any point in time stopped his rebellion, stopped his running, but he kept making bad decision after bad decision, and he finds himself in. Well, I, I hate I hate telling the end of the story or the part of the story ahead of time because this is for next week. He finds himself in the belly of a great fish. How in the world did he get there? One bad decision at a time. Do we find ourselves in the same predicament in our lives where we just can't seem to keep, make, we can't seem to make the good, this one good decision, but we make one bad decision after another? Each bad decision just makes us deep, gets us deeper, and worsens our witness for God, and makes it one just makes it difficult for us in our life. So let's go to verse seventeen. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah. Remember he got thrown off. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. This is God's resolve. But it's your decision. Your decision. He did not have to go into that, way, that, to that fish. He did not have to get thrown overboard. This is all on Jonah. Story about an airplane pilot who's flying a plane, and it crashed over, over the ocean, or over, over a lake, I think it was, and it came down. It started sinking, and everything was flooding. And he, he just, you know, the water was rising, the, the plane was sinking. It was getting dark, and dark, and dark, to a point where he couldn't see anything. He was just about as hopeless as a hope as could be. There's no way out of this. And then he looked up. There was this bright light shining from above. And then he knew that he had hope. I was looking up from the bottom when he finally shined his light on me. Sometimes you have to you have to get to the bottom in order to be able to look up and see what God has for us. Could anything be worse for a person than to be in the belly of a whale? And it's then those moments when there are no distractions, nowhere else to go, there is nothing left to do, nowhere to run. And then that's when we can make the ultimate decisions in our life. And that is turn your life to God. Turn to God. Or die. Literally, he was in that position. If you don't turn your life over to Christ, you will die. And each one of us, at some point in time, faced that reality. When we came to know Christ as our Savior, we had that decision. Do I turn to Christ and live, or do I turn away and do I die? Some folks are so self-absorbed, so self-righteous, and can never humble themselves. They say, I got this on my own. And they just continue. God wants His will for your life. He wants, and, and trust me, His will is going to be so much better than ours. We need to follow. 
And we need to make the, make the decision to obey, to follow. When he says go, yes, Lord, we'll go. We, are we going to have questions? Yes. Are we not going to lie? It's going to make us feel uncomfortable? Probably. That's part of growing. We need to stop being Jones. Stop running from the Lord. We need to start stop thinking more about ourselves than we do others. You see all those Ninevites that he was going to go preach to? Part of the reason why he didn't want to go is because he knew God. Yeah. He said, he, he, he was, if he went and he preached to them, he knew God could and would save them. You know what? Honestly, he didn't want them to be saved. He just assumed turned his back on them. Because they were terrible, terrible people. And he knew that God was a merciful, loving, forgiving God. And if they had heard the gospel, if they had heard the word of God and turned around, repented of their sins, guess what? God would have forgiven them. And he, won't, he didn't want any part of it because they were his enemy. Some preacher he is, huh? Have we ever done that? We're going to know a lot about John and who he really is as we go through this book. We're going to see how sad Jonah's life really was. That he, couldn't re that he could rejoice over the fact that God that God was wanting sinners to repent from their lives. We need to decide to obey today. Maybe the day you're running from God in some way. Maybe it's because of the sins in your life. Maybe it's because of your salvation. God is dealing with you for salvation. Maybe today you've been saved but you need to come to Him. For, South, for baptism and you're fighting that. Maybe it's some ministry. Maybe it's something that, a direction that God specifically wants you to go, but you're, you're fighting and you just want to do what you want to do. And so you begin to run for God and maybe you start making one bad decision after another. And pretty soon you're really far away from God in a situation that you never ever thought you'd find yourself in. Whatever the case. In some ways, we're all running and we may be running from God. Quit making bad decisions. Make one good decision today. Just one. One step to a God and all those other bad decisions go away because you're going to be right with Him. All it took for Jonah was not to... All it took for him was to get right with God. Do that this morning. Quit running away from God. Give Him your life and let Him lead it. So as we stand and prepare for the invitation, I don't know your heart, I don't know your life, I don't know why we're running from God. I don't. Maybe you do need Him. Maybe you are running because He's convicted your heart for salvation. And every time that this, every time that this invitation is given, every single time, I trust me, I know this for a fact. Every single time you just want to go, I'm looking for the door. I can't wait till this is over. Because he's dealing with your heart. Stop making the bad decision of saying, maybe you know, not now. Make the good decision. To cancel out all the bad ones and say, Lord, I accept you. Today. I want you in my life. I'm going to say yes to you. And that one good decision totally takes away all the other bad. The sin in your life, get rid of it. Quit running because you know you're embarrassed by God knowing. God knows already. Just get right with it. Whatever it is this morning, would you make the good decision to say yes?